So we're really concentrating on the two primary ventricular rhythms, yeah. ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. The most dangerous ones. These are the rhythms where, you know, split second decisions directly impact patient survival. Okay, let's begin with the basics. What is that fundamental defining characteristic of ventricular tachycardia on the electrocardiogram? The defining trait is the wide QRS complex. How wide? The duration has to be greater than 0.12 seconds. That is the threshold that points to a ventricular origin. And the rate? We typically see a rate between 100 and 200 beats per minute, but it could definitely go higher, sometimes exceeding 250 beats per minute. And when we're thinking about management, duration is everything. So how do we classify it based on how long it lasts? It's actually a simple cutoff, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Yes. Non-sustained ventricular tachycardia lasts less than 30 seconds. Sustained ventricular tachycardia lasts for 30 seconds or longer. Or it requires intervention. Or it requires intervention to terminate it before it even gets to that 30 second mark. The sustained form is always the higher clinical priority. So let's talk about the differential. If a patient shows up with any wide complex tachycardia, what's the one assumption you have to make right away? The initial assumption must be that the rhythm is ventricular tachycardia until you can prove it's not. That's the foundation of management. It is. And the second rule, just as important, is that your urgency is dictated by the patient's hemodynamic situation. Huh. Are they stable or unstable? Not by how complex the electrocardiogram looks. That distinction is so important because there are things that look like it but aren't. Exactly. So what are the three main possibilities in that differential for a wide complex rhythm? Okay, so the three possibilities are, first, ventricular tachycardia itself. Right. Second, supraventricular tachycardia, but with aberrancy. This means there's a pre-existing bundle branch block or a fascicular block that's widening the QRS. And the third. The third is a pre-excited supraventricular rhythm. This is usually from an accessory pathway, like what you see in Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. And that third one, the pre-excited rhythm, that's where the risk can just skyrocket. Why is that one so critical to identify correctly? Because a misdiagnosis can be fatal. If you treat a pre-excited rhythm, say, an atrial fibrillation, conducting down that accessory pathway Correct. with drugs that block the AV node. Like adenosine or verapamil. Exactly, or even beta blockers. You risk accelerating conduction down that bypass tract, and that can lead to ventricular fibrillation and immediate collapse. So you must never block the AV node if you even suspect pre-excitation. Never. Okay. So with that context, let's focus back just on ventricular tachycardia, monomorphic versus polymorphic. What defines monomorphic? Monomorphic is defined by a fixed, consistent QRS morphology. It just looks the same, beat after beat. And what does that tell us? That consistency suggests the electrical activity is coming from a single, organized focus. Yeah. Usually it's a re-entrant circuit or just one focal site firing very quickly. And what about the much more dangerous polymorphic version? Well, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia shows a variable, chaotic QRS complex. The shape, the amplitude, it's constantly changing. It looks disorganized. Very disorganized. It reflects a chaotic ventricular activation. This almost always causes rapid hemodynamic instability and carries a much, much higher risk of sudden death. And where do you see this more often? We see this more with acute injury. So acute ischemia, an active myocardial infarction, or acute heart failure. You mentioned the heart muscle itself, the substrate. What's the key difference in substrates that leads to monomorphic ventricular tachycardia? So monomorphic ventricular tachycardia most commonly comes from structural heart disease. The classic case is a healed myocardial infarction. Yes, a scar that creates the reentrant pathway. Significant cardiomyopathy also fits here. It's actually less common in acute ischemia alone. And what about when there's no structural disease? We call those idiopathic ventricular tachycardias. They happen in patients with structurally normal hearts. The prognosis for these is generally better, and they are less likely to cause instability. Which again reinforces your point, treat the patient's clinical status first. Exactly. Okay, we have to talk about a specific high-risk type of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, torsades to point. Yes, a very important one. What makes it unique among the polymorphic types? Torsades de point is uniquely associated with a prolonged QT interval when the patient is in sinus rhythm. That baseline abnormality is the setup for it. And the name means twisting of the points. What does that look like on the electrocardiogram? It's the oscillating amplitude of the QRS complex. The peaks seem to get taller, then shorter, then taller again. It looks like the electrical axis is twisting around the baseline. 
there are so many potential triggers. What are the three main categories of causes for torsades to point we need to check immediately? First and most common are drugs. So many drugs. For instance? Tricyclic antidepressants, antipsychotics like haloperidol, certain antiarrhythmics, and even common antibiotics, especially macrolides and fluoroquinolones. Okay, so drugs is number one. What's second? Second is electrolyte abnormalities, mm. specifically low potassium, low magnesium, and low calcium. Hypomagnesemia in particular needs immediate attention. And third? Third would be congenital syndromes, like the different forms of congenital long QT syndromes, where there's a genetic defect in the ion channels. Let's shift completely to acute management, starting with sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. You have an unstable patient. What's the immediate action? If they're unstable, it requires immediate direct current cardioversion, period. You have to convert them instantly. But if the patient is stable, good blood pressure, good perfusion, we have a moment to assess what's the initial workup. You rapidly get a 12-lead electrocardiogram, a focused history, and a physical exam. And the main question you're trying to answer is, is structural heart disease present? Let's follow that path. Structural heart disease is present. A post-infarction ventricular tachycardia. What are the primary class one pharmacologic recommendations? So in that stable structural scenario, cardioversion is still a class one recommendation. For drugs, intravenous procainamide is the primary class one antiarrhythmic option. That's interesting. Why do the guidelines favor procainamide over, say, amiodarone, which seems to be used more commonly in general practice? That's a great clinical point. While amiodarone is used often, procainamide has shown better efficacy for terminating stable monomorphic ventricular tachycardia that comes from scar tissue. It's just more effective at blocking those specific reentrant pathways. So amiodarone is a backup. And finally, on this stable pathway, what if the ventricular tachycardia just doesn't stop with the initial drugs? What's the definitive next step? If the rhythm is refractory, catheter ablation is, again, the definitive step, a class one recommendation. Okay, let's transition now to managing those immediately life-threatening rhythms that are not stable monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Absolutely. The approach changes completely based on whether or not there's a pulse. Okay, so symptomatic ventricular tachycardia, but the patient still has a detectable pulse. How is that managed? This requires synchronous direct current cardioversion. Synchronous is the key word there. It's key. The shock has to be timed to the QRS complex. Yeah. And of course, you must make sure the patient is sedated or anesthetized. If it's marginally tolerated, you could try antiarrhythmics like amiodarone or lidocaine first. What about the immediate action for a pulseless monomorphic or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia? That demands immediate asynchronous defibrillation. There's no time to synchronize. You shock first and the drugs come later, only if needed to maintain a stable rhythm. Going back to torsades to point, if it leads to hemodynamic collapse, what's the electrical intervention? Immediate asynchronous cardioversion, same as any other pulseless ventricular tachycardia. But with torsades, electricity alone isn't enough, right? What are the essential non-electrical treatments? No, it's not enough. You must immediately correct any underlying electrolyte problems. That means intravenous magnesium sulfate and replacing potassium. Second, stop all medications known to prolong the QT interval. And third, Torsades is often dependent on a slow heart rate, so temporary overdrive pacing or an isoproteronol infusion might be needed to increase the heart rate and prevent it from coming back. We end with ventricular fibrillation. How do you define that on the electrocardiogram? Ventricular fibrillation is just chaos. The electrocardiogram shows these disorganized electrical currents with no discernible QRS complex at all. The muscle is just quivering. Generating no output. Zero effective output. Untreated ventricular fibrillation results in death within minutes. And the immediate treatment. Immediate asynchronous electrical defibrillation. It is the only treatment. What about drugs or other procedures? Antiarrhythmic drugs are secondary, given only once a stable rhythm returns. And we are seeing more complex ablation procedures being used to target the premature ventricular contractions that can trigger ventricular fibrillation. So after all these acute measures, what does this mean for long-term survival? Every single patient who survives a cardiac arrest from a ventricular arrhythmia must be evaluated for secondary prevention. And what does that evaluation determine? It's to determine the need for an implantable cardioverter defibrillator before they leave the hospital.